Okay. Okay, I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. It's um, 2.02 p.m. So thank you all for joining us um, for our uh, panel on working on the path to the Z degree. I am Jale Fazalian and I am the Associate Dean of Libraries at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And I am joined here by some colleagues of mine. Before I introduce them, however, I wanna just say a couple of things that you might need to know. Um, live captioning is available during this presentation. You can toggle this on and off if you so choose, and you can use those with the attendee controls at the bottom of your screen to see the closed captioning. Um, this session will be recorded and provided on the conference website following uh, the, at the end of the conference, so you probably see it sometime next week. <clears throat> A um, Please enter all the questions that you have into the Q&A box. Uh, we will do our best to answer them at the end or as they are received. Um, and we encourage you to engage with us and the other attendees through the chat function as well. If you have any technical issues, please contact Tracy Stout. That's T-R-A-C-Y-S-T-O-U-T at missouristate.edu. And now on to our wonderful panel. So joining me today are Tim Anderson. Tim is the System Director of Student Success Technologies for the Minnesota State College and University System. Sorry, hold on just a second. <clears throat> In addition to student technology solutions, Tim leads the system-wide initiatives for course, <clears throat> course resource availability, including Z degrees and the open textbook pilot for teacher education. Tim has built a solid foundation for the OER community to learn and collaborate with peers and to ensure affordability and momentum is maintained across the system. I'm also joined by Ann Fiddler. Anne is the University Open Education Librarian for the City University of New York in the Office of Library Services. This office supports 32 libraries across 24 campuses in the five boroughs of New York City. Anne has been overseeing the Open Educational Resource Initiatives across the university since 2014. She has been the principal in investigator for grants in support of OER for Achieving the Dream, the Gates Foundation, and the Public Interest Technology Network. She is currently leading the university-wide OER initiative, generously funded by the New York State. Since 2016, CUNY has converted more than 30,000 class sections to OER. And finally, Dr. Mike Mills is the Vice President of the Office of E-Learning, Innovation, and Teaching Excellence at Montgomery College. In that capacity, he oversees distance education, staff and faculty professional development, open education resource initiatives, including MC Open and other various international activities. He holds a doctorate and master's degree in educational leadership from the University of Delaware and a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Maryland. Dr. Mills has served on different statewide and national boards representing Montgomery College. He is currently on the Executive Council for the National Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources and serves as the chair of Maryland Online, a statewide consortium focusing on distance education. He recently served six years on the Board of Quality Matters, an international organization dedicated to improving the quality of online learning. He is also a past president of the Maryland Distance Learning Association. So we want to thank all of the three of you for being here to talk about Z degrees and how you got along the path. So to start, I suppose my first question would be, um, and this is really open to whoever wants to go first, please discuss how your program began and what funding was in place to start your Z degree program. Yeah, hi, um, this is Tim. Uh, so our funding got started with the state legislators. I had recognized that OER was an absolute critical part into uh, equitable access for student um, access to materials. And so they um, have been providing um, $250,000 per year for the last four, five, four or six years, four or six years. Um, and so each year we, um, we keep expanding um, and, and granting additional colleges uh, funding and support uh, for Z degrees. And we got our, oh, go ahead, Ann. No, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. We had gotten our start in 2017 um, as we focused on degrees when we received a grant from Achieving the Dream to put a, a Z degree together. And we chose general studies 
for that degree because that served as the catalyst for a number of our other degrees. Most of the courses in that general studies degree were gen ed courses that then transferred over to the other degrees. But it was in 2017 that we got our start with the degree pathway. Great. Um, same here. We um, also received a grant from Achieving the Dream. We had three community colleges involved out of the seven that we have here at CUNY um, involved in that program. And about a year into the program, probably not even that much, um, because of Achieving the Dream, I always give them credit, uh, New York State took notice and called us up one day and said, we want to talk about OER. And so we had a little conversation. And the next thing we knew that gave us $4 million to do OER. Um, we got $4 million and SUNY, the, our state counterpart, got $4 million. So suddenly, we were like rich with OER money. And um, uh, we've been at it ever since. We are now in year five of funding. Wow. So that means $4 million every year. A year. It's not easy to spend $4 million a year. It sounds really great problem to have, but it can be a problem. No, I, I understand that. So, so you talk, you you touched a little bit about this, um, Anne. But how has your funding structure changed over over time? I know some of you started with grants and, um, and maybe have moved into a different funding structure. Can would any of you be able to speak on that, please? Sure. Um, so we started out our uh, spending our New York State money. The majority, the vast majority of the money goes to the campuses, and we we structure it as a grant even though it's New York State money, so it's not really a grant, but um, people seem to respond to that structure and we give them uh, guidelines of you know, what we suggest that they um, um, compensate faculty for converting courses or another compensation structure for picking up courses. We also give them money for uh, staffing, which is super important at the campuses. Uh, so basically we're in year five and every single campus is involved. Every single campus has a project. We've, it's been very consistent over time. We have campus reps, and so I would say that the projects go on at the campuses have become very mature, and uh, we have expectations that we're going to continue this way until CUNY decides they don't want to do this anymore. Just a quick question to follow up, Anne. Does that mean that every campus gets, do you equally divide the money on all the campuses? Are some campuses more um, on the Z degree path than others, and so therefore they get maybe more funding? Uh, yes, it varies widely. Uh, it's based on what they ask for. You know, some have different kinds of capacities. We have bigger schools than others, you know, um, points of view. So we have a couple of campuses that get a pretty good amount of money, but they deliver. You know, we, we do require reporting at the, at the end of the year. We report back to New York State. These are the amount of sections that we've converted. These are the amount of students that have been touched by this. And this is the amount of savings. I mean, our state, our savings, you know, at a place like CUNY with so many students, it, it it grows very fast. I mean, we can say we've saved almost $70 million in students' savings for textbooks since the beginning of the project. Wow, that's great. Um, would anyone else like to talk about how maybe their funding structures have changed over time? Yeah, we um, we got our funding. Um, the first year um, was kind of a surprise because the, uh, the law actually was written to say that we had to come up with at least three new disease degrees within one year. And so, but the funding was spread out over two years. And so we ended up uh, kind of having to split up and we did an in-kind contribution from the Minnesota State System Office uh, to offset some of the costs because we ended up using the full 500,000 the first year. Uh, we did award uh, 10 of our schools uh, funding to implement, uh, I'm sorry, six of the schools to implement uh, a Z degree in the first year. Uh, four of them ended up making it and two made it the following uh, academic year. So we were very successful. We met the requirement. But now we get the same funding every year. But what we're doing now is kind of split the funding up into three parts. Um, we allow schools to get funding to explore whether or not uh, they want to take on a Z degree. So they look at their existing inventory. And so we give uh, campuses $25,000 a year um, to look at that and evaluate and assess where they're at. Hundred thousand dollars to implement a new Z degree, and then for those that are actually implementing Z degree, we give an additional twenty five thousand a year to sustain those uh, degrees. And so we get to add on additional sections, new courses, um, recognizing some teachers you know drop off and some drop down in. So we we try to give some funding for that. So our structuring has changed a little bit in that now we give exploring, implementing, and sustaining grants every year. 
at Montgomery College, we're, we're not part of a system per, per se. Maryland does not have a community college system. So all of the schools uh, look at their own funding. And what we ended up doing was building it into some of our contracts with our faculty to provide uh, stipends or release time to have them develop courses. And that helps us to stay, sustain what we're doing from a, a course development standpoint, but also additional degree development. Great. Well, you're talking a little bit about maybe the next question that I want to address is what impact have Z degrees had on faculty work and engagement? Um, how have you seen faculty really engage with, uh, with, with Z degrees? For yeah. us, um, it, initially, it, it was difficult to get the faculty to see the impact because it, I think for, for many of us, we started talking about the money we were, were saving. Um, as we progressed in our journey, we started talking about the academic successes of our students. And that really spoke to uh, our faculty in, in that we could demonstrate through the use of data that we were, we were helping students uh, quicken their time to degree completion and not doing them any academic harm while at the same time, uh, at this point, saving them upwards of $9 million since 2017. Yeah, we're shifting our uh, faculty um, mindset from saving money, which is absolutely a critical part, but also uh, guiding them along to understand the, uh, the equity and the uh, cultural relevance in which they can attribute to their courses. Um, we have um, a, a large population from the BIPOC community in Minnesota State population. Um, and again, I didn't say we have uh, 37 colleges and universities, 30 colleges, seven universities, 340,000 students. Our demographics are about 35% um, Black. And um, especially in the St. Paul, Minneapolis uh, suburb area, a lot of the curriculum is not from their perspective. And so with the OER, we kind of work with faculty understanding that, you know, you can rewrite stuff to represent the uh, population of your courses. You can, re, you know, change names, change case scenarios and so on. Uh, we did just um, recently um, get an OTP grant, which we're kind of looking at like a Z degree because our thing is, is opening up a pathway um, for zero cost in the teacher education area. But we've introduced a, uh, an instructional designer and an equity coach into the mix. And so the system is actually supporting individual colleges. Right now, we only have colleges doing Z degrees. Our universities haven't taken that on yet. But, but they're actually, uh, we're implementing a new pilot to see how, from a system perspective, equity coaches and instructional designers can help those faculty get to those outcomes of cultural relevance and equitable uh, materials. And, and, and it's turning out to be pretty positive uh, response from the faculty that we're seeing. Um, I would certainly agree with everything that you just said. And I would say at CUNY, we've, we've seen this blossoming of um, open pedagogy and interest in open ped pedagogy all over the place, which a lot of the things you're talking about are open pedagogy. You know, we say come for the OER, stay for the open pedagogy. Um, and that's really what's happened. I mean, we have you know, anecdotally only, but, you know, we get reports all the time. They're so, instructors are so excited. They're re-engaging with their classes. They have been bored for all these years. And now suddenly they're seeing their students in an interesting light. Um, so it's been very exciting. Um, and, and, you know, we've seen themes of, of things that go on around the university. The themes are open pedagogy, open pedagogy, and, you know, as it relates to different areas around the university. So it's, it's invigorating. If, if I could piggyback on what uh, Tim mentioned about this social justice aspect uh, and, and equity, and I think we're seeing a lot more of that at Montgomery College. It, just a few years ago, we were identified as the most diverse community college in the continental US. Um, so we have a, a very internationalized student population. And with that comes this need to be represented in the content that we provide. And uh, what our faculty have discovered is that that's not always the case. So they've used OER to, in essence, decolonize the, the content, the curriculum. And that has really, I think, engaged the students and, and in many cases made the students partners with faculty in finding OER, developing OER, uh, creating this content from 
their perspective and it's been really successful for us. That's amazing. I, um, I like the come for open resources, stay for open pedagogy. We are definitely probably going to steal that from you, Anne. Um, so, we're, so while we're talking about faculty, uh, does this, does OER, does do, uh, working with Z degrees, does that have any um, impact on the tenure and promotion process at your institutions? Are faculty allowed to include these and get credit for these in their TNP um, packets? Um, this is a, a common topic of conversation that we have around here. Uh, we've had a lot of um, high level administrative interest in reevaluating our tenure and promotion process, which dates back to the early 70s and hasn't been looked at ever since. Um, what we what we know is that so many of these processes live within academic departments. So there's there's little that you know there's there is some that we can do from uh, upper administrative level, but it really has to live on the campuses. Um, that being said, it is it has really become a topic of conversation in the faculty senate, you know, on the local level and on the university level. Um, we as members of the doers group have um, Andy McKinney who works with me here at CUNY and Amanda from PC campus, I can't remember her last name, have been working on a uh, tenure and promotion um, uh, uh, packet of you know, things that you should consider in tenure and promotion when it relates to OER. So that will be coming out to the general public in the coming future. Um, and it is definitely something that we say, you know, we'll probably talk about this later in our conversation, but as, it, as OER relates to sustainability, tenure, has to, tenure and promotion have to be part of the conversation. Um, so what support do you provide for faculty other than financial support, obviously, which I hear you all giving, but what other supports do you provide for faculty as they um, either adopt, adapt, or just create OER materials? We have a team of instructional designers that uh, work with the faculty. Our librarians are very involved in that process as they help faculty identify materials, select materials. Uh, so it's a, a total team effort for us at Montgomery. Um, and, and it's just a matter of helping faculty find the right content. Uh, and now what we're finding is that, you know, there's content available, but it doesn't necessarily suit them, their needs as, as a whole. So they're looking for ways to tweak the material or modify that material and add their own content. Uh, so it's a good amalgam of everything, but it's it's a team effort between instructional designers, librarians, and the faculty. Yeah, we, we provide a, a lot of support. Um, when we first got the funding, um, I immediately created a, a community. Um, we're big into using the Teams uh, site. Uh, so anyway, we created a SharePoint site that really um, set the foundation for information for faculty. Uh, specifically how they even begin in the whole process. So we would drive folks to where to begin creating quick start guides by, by discipline. Um, and then we broke into um, the library system and created a, um, a storage repository called Open Dora. Uh, for those in the libraries, it's a derivative of the Island Dora system. And uh, it allows all of our faculty to store not only their textbook, but their entire course content, all the ancillary materials, test banks and everything that then is actually freely available. I'll drop the link into the, the panel here, but, uh, and then we also send our, um, at least one or two per campus, um, again, 37 colleges, 54 campuses. Uh, we've sent folks to the Creative Commons Certificate, so that way we have resources on all of our campus that faculty can go to for licensing uh, questions, you know, the Creative Commons licensing, uh, intellectual property questions, and so on. Um, and, and we also provide all kinds of other foundations, including um, many people probably know about the uh, learning circles that are put on by uh, Minnesota State. I know Karen Pakula has been big into uh, showcasing that nationally. Uh, but we also send our uh, faculty who are new to the ODR development through those learning circles. And it's a 10 week course that guides faculty through the development from start to finish of their curriculum uh, for their courses. 
Um, and so again, I could probably do a whole hour on the supports that we provide, but those are the big ones that um, we, from a system, we're, we're, I guess we're fortunate is what I'm trying to say is from a system level, we're able to help guide local campuses. And so that the resources don't necessarily um, have to be all on the campus to figure this out. We have a, a system-wide initiative that really kind of pushes and economies of scale helping those, those faculty. Yeah, I'd say it. Um, I, I feel lucky that we're uh, we can support it at a system level too, because we have definitely expertise now on the campuses, and they run their training programs and their support programs. But we also uh, we meet regularly with the various campuses, so we share a lot of materials. We have a couple of sites where people can store their materials and share them. I will put also in the chat our Open Ed at CUNY site, where we have a variety of materials. Um, you know, it's hard to harness because so much of the work that we're doing is adopting materials that are already out there and you know obviously revising and remixing them but they're not original works so you know we try and keep it separate what's being created at cuny and you know that kind of thing so um but yeah we do we do um, a lot of shared support and that sort of thing well um, thank you for that. Uh, you know, Anne, you mentioned earlier sustainability, and I definitely want to ask you all: How are you building in sustainability for for these uh, for this D degree for your OER materials? Um, we all know that it's easy to adopt and adapt one thing, um, but then you got to go back to it all the time, right? Um, like all materials. So, can you talk a little bit about your sustainability? Um, sustainability has been the topic of conversation at the center of OER since its inception and how do we make it sustainable. Um, I have a, a couple of conclusions. Uh, one is that it has to be supported by higher administration. Uh, it has to be staffed permanently, has to be both at the central and at the campus level. Um, you know, we've seen so many projects that were great go away with the person whose project it was. So that's always a problem, but staffing, commitment to staffing, and then the tenure and promotion, you know, because just my opinion, but I think that um, faculty generally um, reviews and revises their courses in the course of teaching, you know, regularly in the course of teaching, you know, just because it's OER doesn't mean that they shouldn't, you know, they should get paid again to be doing that, you know, they would do that just as they might do anything else. But if, if tenure were built into it, I think that would be a, big, a really big incentive. Yeah, we, we've been working with other state legislators uh, to get funding um, for the sustainability. And uh, this will be the first year, uh, this is the first fiscal year that we've actually received funding from our state legislators. I'm not providing a lot, but it's something. So we're getting 50,000 um, a year for the sustainability piece of it. Um, but we also recognize that um, it's hard for campuses to really kind of track, you know, whether that pathway is remaining open, especially as, you know, faculty change and, and so on. So we found, and this is my plug for course markings, is even if campuses don't use course markings, even having course markings in place allows, one, for us to report to the state legislators the impact that we have on our students, and two, for the campuses then to pull those course markings to be able to track um, those courses, make sure they're within, uh, that pathway remains open. One of the things we found um, is that, um, if you just have your courses labeled as zero cost, low cost, or, or however you use your course markings, um, you still don't know which ones are in the Z degree pathway. So we actually took a step forward, and this will be the first year we're actually be uh, imposing a new called ZDC, which is a Z degree course. So you can have an OER, zero cost, no textbook use, or ZDC in those course markings. And now we can actually track ZDC to make sure all the courses that are in the pathway are available within a two year period. That's be tied at least once within two years, right? For a two year degree. So um, that's one way we're helping our faculty or our administrators on the campuses reduce the burden of, you know, how do, how do they report that pathway? Um, so that's how we're helping in, in that regard. At Montgomery, our chairs and deans do a really good job of keeping track of that information. They, they look at that on a regular basis. And as Tim said, uh, you know, we're a two year school, so those classes have to be offered at least once every two years. And uh, when faculty change, that, that can certainly be a problem. One of the things that we have uh, looked at and have developed in some areas are, are common courses where you know, they can be, they're developed by a team and then they, different faculty can be plugged into 
those courses um, modified as necessary, but it's an opportunity to create some consistency, even if faculty uh, change jobs or change institutions. Great. So this is hopefully tied a little bit to sustainability, but can you talk about how Z degrees are managed in general on your various campuses? And I know some of you have many campuses and some of you have one. So um, can you just talk about how Z degrees are managed across your systems or your campus? Yeah, we provide a, a project manager, namely me, <laughs> who works with the local campuses. So as we do the awards, um, what we do is we put that foundation in place. Um, uh, so we have an application process that goes out every year that says, hey, what type of um, uh, project are you looking to do against that exploration, implementation, or sustaining, or expansion? Um, and then what happens is they each get a tracking sheet. They actually get their own uh, SharePoint site uh, with all the critical uh, tracking elements, including a tracking sheet. Those tracking sheets are all the same across all institutions, so that way we can obviously easily pull all the data for reporting. But that tracking sheet allows the campuses to track all the courses in the pathway, the faculty that are assigned to it, how many sections they're doing, and the status of those projects. So hasn't started. It was a zero cost even before the you know, project began. So there's all kinds of different ways we give them uh, the ability to track. Uh, we found it's very successful because then it actually gives them a percentage of how far along they are, has a you know, ticker that you know, says, hey, here's your deadline for your Z degree, how many days, weeks they have left in that project. And so we provide that foundation for them and then have um, uh, monthly meetings um, with those campuses to kind of answer questions. And, and I think Ann hit it earlier. Um, I think it was you, Ann. It could have been another section, sorry. <laughs> a lot of information on OER today. But there's a lot of questions about what's included and what's not included in those courses, right? So what's considered zero cost? You know, what if I have art supplies? What if I have lab materials? Um, and so we work with those campuses to make sure that they all have the same understanding. We're working off the same playbook and that there's no uh, misunderstanding because we want to make sure each college says they're dropping Z degree, the student transfers, it's the same experience, right? As far as what materials are required. Um, the course resource affordability work committee that we've have have made a strong recommendation that says everything's got to be zero cost in that degree program. And so we're working with our libraries to make sure that, like, for example, if there's a geology class in, in the pathway, right, that maybe geology kits can be checked out from the library, right, so it still becomes zero cost to the students. The, the tricky part is whenever you say it's zero cost, it's has to be zero cost to every student in there. So it's not just like, you know, 50% um, can afford the uh, geology kit, 50% can't. So we'll make 50% available and it has to be 100%. And so we work with those faculty to make sure, um, again, understanding, foundation, project management, and those learning circles are in place to make them successful throughout the, the process. That to me is, is the critical component um, is, is having everyone work together. And you know, we have we have faculty who, full-time faculty who may adjunct somewhere else in the, the DC area. So those institutions have different definitions of, of Z or or OER. And so they go back and forth. And we made a decision at Montgomery uh, to really call out that we were offering Z degrees and not OER degrees, because we have a number of faculty who direct their students to the library databases. And, and while those databases provide a charge to the institution, they're free to the students. Um, and so, but they're not open. And, and so, you know, we, we made a conscious decision to really focus on the Z. And for us, it's instructional textbook costs. We have some courses, art courses, for example, that require students to buy some lab uh, materials and and they're still counted for us as Z. Yeah, when we defined our glossary, it took um, literally a year for the common terms, and so we had this uh, again this uh, course resource affordability committee, um, and just to make sure everybody's on the same page. And there was a lot of going back and forth. And one of the interesting things that we came across is we came up with a definition on library curated materials. Is one of them. We actually heard from a publisher 
who actually threatened to sue us based on our definition of library curated materials because we used the term library purchased instead of saying resources available through the library. It was something about, it was an obscure law that we don't even know if it exists or not. But the point being is there's people keeping an eye on these, on these projects, especially from the publishing companies. You may not know they're from kind of visiting the websites that we probably put out there, but they are. Um, and so it's kind of, we're very careful about acknowledging, you know, that and, um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, you think it'd be straightforward saying, hey, what is a Z degree? What's library uh, curated materials? And for the record, the, the one, the other challenge we had, there is no degree in Z. We actually, again, we had to address that a Z degree really isn't a degree, right? And so I don't know if you, you both have had that same uh, conversation, but, uh, we've really had to kind of work with our, our bargaining units or labor relations groups from our faculty to describe exactly, yes, we realize it's not a degree, but yeah, it's zero cost. <laughs> so anyway, just kind of fun note. Yeah, I would say we focus on the zero cost too and the library curated materials. Um, and certainly I concur with you about the publishers watching. They are definitely, most definitely watching. Um, you know, I must comment just one thing about the Z degree, at least as a panned out here, um, we found that uh, everybody loves the idea of a Z degree and it is a great idea, but we found the path to be a thin one, as they say, you know, which, which means that a student could go through, but they would have to consciously find the courses that would enable that to happen. So we do, folk, we have sort of shifted our focus on high enrollment, high impact courses. So we reach the most students um, because, you know, although we talk about all these other things, which I think are definitely important, you know, the pedagogy and the cultural relevance and, and the mixability and all that stuff. Um, the bottom line is, you know, we were, our impetus to do this was the cost because we are dealing with, you know, we're a public institution in New York City. So we have many students who absolutely cannot afford textbooks and it is a barrier to education. So. I think where we run into that that same situation is with our degrees that have uh, various electives. And so the students, if they want to take a Z degree or a Z pathway, really have to pay attention and be conscious of which courses they're, they're taking, because some of the courses that they could take for that degree are not necessarily Z. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it, it truly is a pathway for them that they have to follow. Yep. Yep, and this is why we um, we use the course markings for the institutions that are doing Z degrees. We're piloting course markings with those institutions, so students while they're registering can find those courses. Um, in, in the old days, probably two years ago, <laughs> they used to just put the uh, the cost into the description of the course. So students had to do some work and some digging to look at the course description to see that this is a zero cost or no textbook used in the course. Um, and kind of build on your, your thing. The high impact, what we're looking at is um, trying to expand our focus. Yes, there's a Z degree pathway where we have our 33 you know, courses that typically on average is what the camps are doing. But now we're taking a step back and saying, well, what about those students who can't even get into that pathway? So now we're starting to focus on and actually awarding money to those camps to say, we're gonna include developmental ed courses as well, yeah. just so that students can afford to get even into that two year program to graduate. Yeah, same here, same here. Well, and, uh, Tim, I think that goes to the, the whole equity issue as to when students can register and when can they pay? And if they can't pay or they drop from that pathway and it, there, there's a whole equity act and access discussion centered around that. Well, that kind of leads me to my next question, which is a little bit about inclusive access. You know, we talk about one of the powerful things about OER is that it's available the first day. You don't need anything. You can just click on it. The students can read text before they even start the class. So can you talk? Uh, can you all talk a little bit about what efforts are being made towards inclusive access in, in your Z degrees? We're opposed. We're, we're very vocal about being opposed. Um, we, meaning me and my little group of people. There may be other people here around who are not at my university, but um, the reasons are that it's it's um, it's smoke and mirrors. Yes, you know who's paying for it. First of all, are we forcing the students to pay for it? We're we're closing them out of other markets like used book markets, rental markets, 
um, other other means of access. Uh, if you buy a code and you fail the course, do you need to buy the code again? Yes, you do. Um, so there's a lot of things about it that aren't straightforward. And, and I'm not opposed to the idea of it, but I think the name of it needs to be state what it is. So just for your information, and I'm just stating a point of view, of course, you're all well, may have your varying uh, points of view, but Spark did a very interesting um, website just presenting all the sides of it. And it's very gentle and it's good for administrators. Just read through it and decide for yourself, you know, is, is it what they're saying? In the case of CUNY, we've had very little entree into it because of um, it's been barred by legal because students don't see their option to opt out. And because of that, it violates their choice ability. Um, so it hasn't really, it's come up here and I've certainly seen it tried to creep in many times. Uh, we get, you know, phone calls from someone saying they're trying to get inclusive access in. <laughs> and so, you know, but um, I'm gonna put it in the chat, the, uh, the website. That's just my one strong opinion. Well, I would echo what Ian said. I, I often say it's not inclusive access, it's exclusive access because it excludes as many people as it includes. Um, where we struggle in my office, which is a central office, is when the, the publishers go directly to the faculty member and they, they pitch this idea of, of inclusive access or first day access, whatever they, they are calling it. And it sounds great to the faculty member, but then as you talk with them and explain to them what it actually does, most of them have backed off from that at our school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we are, we cannot be opposed or in favor because we have academic freedom in our institutions and we have to allow the faculty to select. Um, however, the best way of doing it obviously is to inform them of some of the issues. And one of the things that we do is because we have academic freedom, um, if you think about a student who may be at one of our colleges, and let's say Ann and, and Michael are both teaching at that, Michael's using Cengage and, and Ann's using a, a different platform. I don't know all the platforms out there, but, um, but and I'm the student. Okay, not only do now I, I have to pay for the platform for Michael for Cengage, but I also have to pay for, <laughs> for Ann. And it could be as many classes I have as many different platforms. So now I've gone from, you know, you know, this much in textbooks to this much in inclusive access platforms I have to pay for. So that's the one thing we're kind of looking at. And that's the downside of the, the I won't say downside of academic freedom, but that is an impact of academic freedom on the cost to the students. And it has the, the opposite effect, I think, of what it's intended to do. And, and finally, the last thing with inclusive access, we're also acknowledging that students lose access the day after class is over. And so that is also another kind of, they can't use those resources that they might have acquired some in another fashion to build on their knowledge later on and, and apply that in a different course per se. So, so that's some of the things we, we deal with. Thank you all for those opinions. And that's okay. You know, I'm glad we have strong opinions and also no opinions. So um, that's that's good, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about the data that you share with your administrators about um, the success or failures that you have in these in these programs? Um, sure. Was, go, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go. No, Ann, go right ahead. Um, so I know that Tim's been talking about course markings, and um, we do course markings here. We have a ZTC and we have an LTC. Um, we did the ZTC first and then we sort of as a courtesy to those who might feel excluded because they have a, a novel that's you know a, a modern novel and you, you have to buy it and it costs ten dollars we made an ltc of 25 dollars or less mm -hmm. um but we are lucky in that our system has one um, management system so we can see courses that are marked and we can slice it and dice it we can see it by school uh, we do share it back you know when i said my comment about we we've, we've um, converted over 30,000 courses sections. I know that because we can see that fairly easily. Uh, we can also look at who's registering for them. Um, we have a big um, communication problem. So as much as we try to put this in the student psyche, we're a commuter schools and we, it's really hard to reach them. So generally, uh, despite our best efforts, I don't think student, we, you can search for a course by ZTC, but I don't think they're availing themselves of that. We did find one student who took 12 courses. So we know that student figured it out. 
but why didn't he tell his friends? That's what I don't understand. <laughs> so, um, so, so we are, you know, even though that system is a headache for everybody, people literally quit over it. For us, it's been a real godsend that we could, you know, we could use it to our advantage. We can see easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael, did you have something before I jump in? Sure. Uh, some of the data that that I share out of my office is each semester we take a look at the success rates of our Z courses compared against all courses. Um, and we break that down by gender and ethnicity. Um, and what we've been able to show over the, the past four or five years is this consistency that students in these courses are doing as, as well or, or better in some cases than students in the non-Z courses. Um, and so for us, it's, it's been a real big selling point in providing the release time for faculty and that you know students are, are enjoying the classes, they're more engaged. We, we do surveys of our students um, and they, they just like it better and they're doing as well as they are in their non-Z courses. Mm -hmm. We we had a, um, a whole project lined up, um, and then I don't know COVID hit. But we had <laughs> we were going to do the same type of thing. Michael was saying, um, trying to get an experimental or a control group together and then kind of follow um, a couple cohorts along to find out you know those success persistence DFW you know typical things. But what we can do right now is um, one of the things that we looked at is because we do have one student information system for all of our campuses, which I know this sounds surprising, but many campuses we have, but we do. We have one LMS and one student information system. And so uh, what that allows us to do is really say, are we even targeting the right students? Are the right students even getting into these courses? So based on the demographics of our students, we found out that, yeah, we have parity in, 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 in who we're uh, affecting with these classes. So. Um, that's really exciting. And then we also can tell because we have um, the course markings, you know, the number of students are being impacted. So to make sure that they really are the high volume courses are, you know, the ones that are being focused. Um, that's how we did our teacher education program is really looking at what's the biggest enrolled classes so we had the biggest impact. Um, we know how many seats are in a class, how many students actually enrolled. So not only can we say, here's how much we saved our students, but here's how much you could have saved if you were filled your class type of thing, right? So then we have several metrics in it. But the important part is, is right now is making sure we're hitting the right populations in these courses, that we're advertising it well enough. Students can find them um, and the students who need the zero cost. Not all students I mean, are affected the same way by the textbook cost. So we wanna make sure those students who need it get into those courses so they can be successful. We, uh, we did a research study a few years ago that showed students who were taking one or two Z courses per semester we're taking about three additional credits per semester compared to those who weren't taking any Z courses. And if they were taking three or four Z courses, they were taking a little more than five credits additional per semester. And that just goes to aiding in degree completion and, and getting them out of Montgomery College quicker into the workforce or in, in most cases transferring, but it, it really, hits home how quickly these courses can benefit students. Right, and there's another metric, like I wonder, because um, in our two-year colleges, I mean, we have the university system as well, is if the student had a good experience in our two-year college, we would hope they would transfer to a four-year within the Minnesota state system. So I'd be curious to say of those students who are going through the OER, are they more likely to stay within the Minnesota state system? Or are they gonna go somewhere else? Because we want to make sure, I mean, I thought that might be a kind of a neat, attribute to look for as well. It's all really fascinating. Now, you you all know that I have more questions to ask you, but I also want to make sure that um, our attendees who are listening in uh, get the chance to ask, ask their questions. So we have one question here, um, and attendees, please, uh, please, please feel free to send them in or else I'll just go go back to my list. But the question that's being asked is, does Minnesota have a sunsetting process for course content in their repository? And just answered that. But yeah, currently <laughs> we uh, we do not. Um, and I, that, that's a great question. So I will check with um, 
with our PALS team. Our, we have a, a group of 14 staff who actually manage our library system and also um, manage the open door system. So certainly we'll work with that group to see, you know, what those opportunities are. I'm assuming that when you talk about sunsetting, if, if a book becomes obsolete, um, that we would make sure it's not available or what's um, the intent of that question? We didn't get a follow-up to that, Tim, but maybe we will in a minute. Let's move on and that person can can uh, come back and, and uh, answer or ask more questions if they like. Um, so this is really for anyone. Are you aware of successful equitable access models for course materials? Yeah, I was going to say a model that was out there that I, I'll, I'll think about this. Michael looks like he's going to say something. I'm no, I, I'm I'm trying to 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 wrap my head around what what that model might look like. I've not seen anything or, or we haven't used anything like that at Montgomery. Yeah, we just started our teacher education program and somebody um, had submitted to us at the last conference I was at um, an idea for a model around specifically for teacher education. Um, I filed it, just haven't gotten back to it quite yet. <laughs> but um, so I apologize. I'd, I'd like to be able to see if I can drum that up real quick. Here's. Well, as we wait for more questions to come in from our attendees, I'll ask a question that I have, which is, um, you know, you talked a bit about your impact the Z degrees have on student pot body, but have you actually, you know, surveyed your students to ask them uh, or specific courses that you know um, are high users of uh, the Z degree materials? Have you asked the students the impact that this is having on them? We have surveyed our students on, at an institutional level, but then we've had faculty survey students at the course level. And invariably, it, it comes down to the, the idea that, yes, students are focused on saving money. And while we thought initially they would reinvest that savings into education, what they tell us is, yeah, that sounds great. That's utopia, but we need some of this money for just living expenses, daycare, rent, food. And now with the price of gas, going the way it is, uh, they just needed to get to campus. Um, so for, for us, it, the, the savings that um, they realize have had tremendous impact for our students. And, and we have some data that demonstrate that. Yeah, I would say the same um, for us. We have sur surveyed students university-wide and for some reason it, it went away in the, in the pandemic, but for a couple of years, we were surveying them regularly overwhelmingly positive responses. Um, I think, you know, for the reasons that Mike was saying too, because the another thing that we've done, you know, through the libraries is this tabling process where you lure them over with candy and you say, if you didn't have to buy your textbook for your bio course, what would you buy? And then it's very, you know, breaks your heart what they would buy. They would buy food and rent and sneakers and, you know, transportation and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think that that kind of money they're getting back from uh, saving textbooks money, it's its literally going to feed themselves and their families. Yeah, I did put a, um, a link to the uh, YouTube video that we actually created a nice video, a five minute video, um, talking to our students about that same thing about, you know, their experiences with OER and the ability to you know, pay rent, food, you know, the, the typical story that we hear. Um, but it also focuses on teachers as well. So it had both teacher comments and faculty comments. Uh, the teacher's perspective is really kind of a nice thing to, and refreshing because um, they realize the impact they're having on students and it actually makes their job personally uh, more rewarding from, from what I've heard from them is that because they know that students aren't stressed over it, food insecurity because, well, they may be, but I mean, the textbook's not, or their course isn't contributing to that, let's put it that way. So there's a question in the Q&A that's just asking, um, do you collect your data continuously or do you do it, um, you know, as like one time study? The academic success data that we collect is done every semester. So we, we look at that 
that uh, at the end of every semester, we compare success rates um, for Z courses versus non Z courses in different modalities also. And that, that's done uh, twice a year. Yeah, we collect data a couple of times a year. We're asked to do that. Yep, and ours is annually. I think the campuses might be surveying students after each course. Again, I don't work specifically at the campuses, but from what I've heard from faculty, uh, they're actually asking the students about the quality uh, of the, the textbooks after each course. So. Right. Um, we got a comment back about the equitable access. So it says equitable access is a flat rate per credit hour for all required course materials, including digital, physical, and course supplies, charge registration, and part of tuition and fees. Um, is this part of, uh, it's part of the institutional charge for financial aid purposes. Um, I don't know if any of you have this at your institutions. I know that um, I had this at my undergrad and it was amazing. So, yeah. We do not have that at Montgomery College. Um, it's not built into the tuition. No, we don't either. Yeah, I'm not aware of it. Although I know I had that for my doctoral program. <laughs> it was kind of nice. You always, you always know what to expect. It's kind of nice, but no. Um, I, can I just make a comment that I, us panelists, I think when we're posting in the chat, we think we're posting to everyone, but we're only posting to the host and panelists. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes. Um, oh. So I just wanted to point that out that there might be some links that we might want to share um, that we're intended to share with everybody. Yes, I, I, I just noticed that. Thank you, Anne, for pointing that out. The, um, the Open Dora, Tim, went to just the hosts and panelists, yeah, as, did, um, as huh. did your video. Yeah, I'll put those. I know, everything I posted before the inclusive access, which was when I realized that that was happening, and I changed it, my settings. But um, so everything, I think, did that. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> OK. Oh. So um, in, uh, uh, equitable access apparently is coming up at the next session, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, we have a few minutes left. Um, I think maybe we have time for maybe one more question. If you could start all over again, what would you do? What, if anything, would you do differently with these programs? I probably things, but I feel like we're doing it right. Um, it, it feels good. It feels like we've accomplished a great deal. Um, it's a program that I've been most proud of of anything I've ever done. I mean, it's been amazingly uh, gratifying, just the, the university collaboration and acceptance and excitement over this, even now, five years into it, you know. So I'm yeah, sure we, there's plenty we could have done better. <laughs> We, we would have included the bookstores, I think, earlier on. Yeah. Um, we're actually in our, yeah, yeah, calculate, it's actually the fourth year, and this is the first year we've actually been strategic about including bookstores in the discussions. You know, we, we've heard in the past that bookstores were not, you know, going to support this, and it turns out that was not a correct assumption. Uh, bookstores, you know, employees have the same perspective on student success as we do and, and shame on us for not including them earlier but we got them involved and we're actually making some great strides uh, specifically one of the things that we have the opportunity is um, we use the Missouri bookstore um, software program for community colleges and that has an ability to push textbook costs into our student information system which then we're now we're trying to say okay so put, in addition the cost can you also push the textbook cost type then becomes searchable for students, right? Because they can't search on cost the way we have it. So anyway, so we're kind of looking at now expanding, now that we've got the books are involved, expanding the course markings ability to reduce the burden on the campuses. Or if we can push that from a bookstore, we don't have to have the deans and, 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 or their assistants or registers or whoever's collecting that information to input it manually into the system. We can automate it. So that would be our thing is getting those bookstores involved early on. I think for us, if we had to start all over again, we would have taken a look at degrees from the very beginning and not necessarily one-off courses and then have to figure out how to patch all those together in a degree. But if we had, could have identified multiple degrees at one time and then built 
a pathway that way. It, it, I think it would have been easier for us. But like like Ann, I cannot think of anything more rewarding in the, the past five years than, than the work that we've done here. Great. Well, it doesn't look like there are any more questions in the Q&A. I don't know. I, I want, we have a couple of minutes left. Panelists, is there anything else that you'd like to add? I didn't, is something I should have asked you that I didn't or anything you want to make sure that you, that you say to, to this group? Uh, what I would say is if you have uh, labor relations with faculty, it's absolutely critical you reach out as we have student, uh, faculty labor uh, unions at all of our institutions. And it's very important to engage them early on um, in the discussion. Um, we know we have had a couple of our colleges that were um, delayed on that first year. We had two colleges is because they had to stop and negotiate with labor relations explaining that because the fact they have this assumption that you know, especially with the course markings and stuff that, you know, if I'm not teaching OER, I'm going to be looked at as a bad person because, you know, students are going to be able to find these courses. They're not going to take my courses. It's that whole myth about why students pick courses, just like when we went to online, not everybody went to online, right? And so it's kind of walking through that and doing the myth busting. And there's some good articles out there about myth busting. And, uh, but that would be my recommendation for folks is include them in your discussions from the beginning and students. So. My suggestion would be to look at, uh, to work across institutions to develop some of these courses. That, you know, we, for foreign languages, for example, that, that is very difficult to create good foreign language courses and trying to minimize the cost on any one institution by working across institutions, I think would be beneficial. Uh, but instead, most of us, did those high enrolled gen ed courses. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking for a, a general psych course, there, there are a million of them out there, um, but it would be look across the institutions for me. I would jump on that and say, you know, I would even reach out nationally, you know, the CCC OER listservs and the other listservs are incredibly responsive. And if, if, if you're looking for expertise, there's always somebody there who will answer your question. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that the work has been so fun in a way is that it really feels like a national coming together over this and um, they're, they're a really helpful community. Great. Well, thank you for present for being part of the panel and attendees, thank you for attending. Um, attendees, please provide feedback uh, for this session on the survey that will pop up once the session ends. Um, an overall conference survey will be emailed to you after the end of the conference. We also invite you to attend the next session, which is at 3.30, and it is the, a bookstore panel. Um, so uh, I hope that is a nice little dovetail to what we've been talking about. So we hope that we will see you there and um, that you have a good rest of your day. So thank you all. <laughs>